Welcome to another episode of Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. We have another two greats who've come back to the show to talk more about their careers and also get their impressions on some of the issues in the game as well. David Gillespie and Brent Sherwin, thanks for coming back, boys. No worries. Afternoon, Bill. From two different but very successful eras that the Bulldogs have enjoyed. Just a couple of bits of housekeeping. Firstly, we have a big game coming up against Canberra and only a few games to go before the end of the season. And uh, some interesting issues around what Cameron Seraldo does with this club now looking forward to 2024, of course. We've heard this week that Tavita Pangai Jr. has retired from the game, so that leaves a bit of a hole in the list that the club has to look at, but we'll let them take care of that. But generally speaking, um, wanted to talk about defence. Obviously another problem for the team on the weekend against Newcastle, and it looked really bad at half time. Uh, they, they shored things up a little bit in the second half. But in general terms, I wanted to talk to you guys about how it was organised back in the day. What what goes into organising the defence of a team? Cement, firstly, uh, you were renowned for it, of course. Uh, have to mention the standout was Viliami Kikau's hit on Phoenix Crossland. That was classic old-style stuff. That would have taken you back when you saw that hit. No, it was. It was. Um, I did see it, actually, on the weekend. I watched 10 minutes of the game, and that was the 10 minutes I watched... <laughs> Um, is is um, that hit he put on, and it was a beauty. Um, but unfortunately, there wasn't many more of them, and um, and there's not many more of them hits in the game today. Mm. You know, the game's changed a bit since I played in the eighties and the nineties, and um, so um, it gets a bit frustrating to sometimes to watch um, uh, the old, you know, when you when you played that long ago. So, um, but mate, it's a, I feel a bit sorry for him sometimes with in in defence because the way the game is played today is that quick, mm. you know. And if you get a few sets of six on you, it's you can't keep them out. Mm. You know, mm. it's hard to keep them out. They get two or three sets of six on back to back to back to back, you know. And um, that's happened to a lot yeah. of teams this and, year, not just the Bulldogs. Um, we were seeing what momentum can do. How did it work in the old days? Firstly, we'll start off with how much is structure and how much is attitude when it comes to defence. Um, well, it's a bit of both, obviously, more, more attitude, um, you know, and back in the 80s when, when Warren was there, we'd come in with a, a defensive attitude mm. back then and, um, you know, he it was just rammed into us at training, you know, and um, uh, so, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, bit, a bit of chemistry there. Everyone, everyone's got to be on the same page and, mm. um, you know, um, and there were some good defenders in that side. Um, but you know, a whole different ball game. But but a lot of it's attitude, and you've got to um, have your head right. And you know, it's you know, um, it is structure. And but a lot of it's individual is footwork, and and you know where to place yourself, which is you don't do that much these days. Mm. Um, you know, so it was a bit of practice went into it. Shifty, I know we talked in the last show you were on about how you organised the attack, and it was a really interesting insight that Shifty gave us as to how he worked the team around the field and what he needed to do at different times in the set and where they were at that time. What about defence? How much role did you play uh, or does the, does the halfback play in, in organising the defence? Um, not too much. I was more of a spot player. They always found me. But uh, <laughs> nah, I just uh, left it up to General, who's standing at the back, and he can, he can see what's going on and where the holes are. So he'd uh, direct you. Mm. And then, um, as I was saying before, me and Braith had a bit of a combination where – as I, if I kicked it down into the corner and I was on the right side, I'd give him a nod and he'd go to the left and I'd go to the right. So I was kind of hidden because I didn't – I'd get a fair bit of traffic sent my way, being a, one of the smaller guys, but I just uh, put my body in front of him and hold on and hopefully oh, – well, I had Willie Talao or Nigel Vagano on one side and Sonny Bill and Rennie Mature on the other. So they'd come and help me. It, it's – that hasn't changed, obviously, um, in, a, in a game where there's a lot of big blokes out there now right across the field. There aren't too many smaller players in the line uh, these days, and they do run at them at every opportunity, don't they? And that, that's yeah. that's got to be a team thing, really, to help those players because without a lot of those players, uh, we miss out on a lot of the entertainment that rugby league provides. So there's a lot of rules now to protect them that weren't there when you were playing, mate. That's right. But, um, yeah, Shifty's right. It was um – and you, you did spot the halfbacks back then, you mm. know, and it's it's a bit different now. But um, you know, that was part of the game plan. You know, get get to them, and um, you know, and um, you can get an offload off, or you know. Um, but then you know, we had Turvey there, and Turvey was kind of um, wasn't up in the line back in them days. You know, he was mm. covering. He was mm. just keeping back. 
you know, and 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 the and the and the playmakers like Sterlo too, and 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 players like that, you know, they wanted their energy for attack. They didn't want to be making tackles, you know. I mean, they they were saving all their energy for the, to guide them around on the field, and um, you know, that's that's the way it was played. That that was a, a pretty common strategy in those days. Was was wear out the bloke who's going to give you the most trouble with the ball. Um, it, do you think that's still – it was certainly true still in your era, surely, and, and must be true still today, I mean, they, when they can do that. Yeah. Well, every year I tried to bring that back. I used to go and talk to folks here, but he'd just say, get in the line, mate, and put your body in front of him. <laughs> so, but that's – yeah. It's like Cement said before, it's um, attitude and willing to do that 1%, do that extra effort, take that couple of steps, and you you got to – when you're in defence, you got to know – the guy next to you is doing the same thing you are mm. and he's in the right spot so you can worry about yourself, worry about what's coming at you instead of looking to your right and left to see if they're in the right spot and then trying to watch what they're doing with the ball. How how hard is it to maintain attitude when you've had a score put on you or maybe it's become a two or three scores, say, in a bad season? What, what do you do? Um, you know, it's, you, you're not going to make every tackle in a game. You know, and you're going to miss some here or there. But as, as Shifty said, you know, you've got to have confidence in the blokes around you and they're looking after you. And, mm. and um, you know, you, you know, you're going to miss tackles here and there. No one's perfect. You're going to miss some here and there. And, um, uh, you know, and it get, gets back to, um, you know, off the field too. You know, um, everyone gets on and, you know, mm. and so there's a, lot, there's a lot of factors go into it. But as I said, the, today's game, um, you know, you can, you, you know, if you got to a score of 20 to 8, you'd not shut the game down, but you nearly win mm. back when we were playing, you know. Yeah. But today, 28-2 is not enough. You can get <laughs> run down. Yeah. You can get run down in 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. You know, four tries without blinking. You know what I mean? The, the frequency so of scoring, <laughs> yeah. Is, have you noticed that? Uh, both of you in the yeah. different eras you've played. I mean, 20 years before him, 20 years before now. So there's a, there's a big separation there, isn't there, really? and yeah. and. So have you guys looked at that and thought, wow, the, the speed with which they're crossing the line is, is well, amazing? The ro- yeah, the roll on some of the teams get, it's um, like unseen. Mm. It's crazy. I don't know. I think uh, the, the Rabbits get, always get on one. Storm are unbelievable. Mm. Watched them the other day. They, were just, they just kept going. Same thing, same thing, running hard. And they run good lines, so it's hard to defend. Yeah, I think in today's game, like, you, the good sides, even Penrith can get 20 put on them. That's the difference, but the the worst sides coming down the bottom can get forty or fifty put on them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They're, yeah, you, yep. you're not going to stop them from scoring. They're going to score, but the good sides narrow it down to between ten and twenty points. Or you know, mm. the bad ones are getting fifty and sixty put on them. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, when when we we're defending, we always no one comes through us, and that's what we said all the time. After they'd score, no one's coming through us. If they do this miracle. 30 metre pass across three of us and they score in the corner, so be it. Mm. But they're not coming straight through us. Right. So we try to be a wall and that's that's our attitude. So that's what we try and do. Uh, coincidentally, uh, the second highest score the Bulldogs scored this season was against Canberra, uh, but they lost that game 34-30. That game comes up again this weekend in Canberra. Our stats man, Darren Andrews, says that the Raiders are on a record seven-game winning streak against the Bulldogs. That's historically their best run Against this club, um, uh, yeah, I, I suppose now with a few games left, there's a lot to sort out, and uh, it's just a matter of it's sort of grand final time or semi final time for a club that's not going to make the eight, isn't it? Well, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Now there's players playing for contracts, so they're all just they just got to step up. I think that's just put their right foot forward and just not let them through. Yeah, yeah, but they, they're coming up a side that got fifty put on them too. Yeah, that's yeah. right. You know. Last week. What what are the Raiders? You never know what the Raiders are going to do, do you? No. Um, nah, even right. if they're on their home ground, you just can't guarantee what they're going to do. No. And they are in a dire position I don't, in terms of their finals situation uh, with a lot of threats uh, around the bottom of the eight still. So the, their, their season's on the line as well. So a, a really tough game for the Bulldogs, but who knows? Um, they've had some pretty good results this year in, in the middle of some of the weird ones that we've talked about. And just quickly, I want to mention too that uh, the Bulldogs on Tuesday the 15th, which was VP Day, that's Victory in the Pacific in World War II, donated $10,000 from the sale of the Anzac Round jerseys 
to the Kokoda Track Memorial Walkway. That's a, a special walkway that runs between roads and Concord in Sydney and it's, uh, it's arrayed with a whole lot of memorial tributes and so... Lovely gesture from the club there, and it came appropriately on VP Day this week. We're talking to David Gillespie and Brent and brought to you by Reclaim the Game. When we come back, it's dog days. We'll have a look at 1985 with Cement and 2002 with Shifty, which was a great but then not so great year for this club, but it was quite a remarkable time to be a player in the blue and white. All that coming up. Betting takes you away from the action. It can distract you from footy's most exciting moments. Don't let a bet take you away from the match. Reclaim the game. Be gamble aware. Welcome back to Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. David Gillespie and Brent Sherwin with us. Shifty and Cement, as you know them, uh, a little more comfortably. Now, we're going to talk about the dog days, and we'll get, we've will get we talked about those days with Shifty and Cement before, but we're going to get into a couple of years specifically now. Uh, for you, Cement, 1985, because we talked a lot on this program about the great rivalry uh, with Parramatta in those early 80s to mid-80s, in fact, into the late 80s, I guess. Shifty, firstly... W- how old were you then, and and what were you doing? What was your relationship with the game? Um, I think I was yeah, six or seven, and just playing for a uh, St Luke's. It was like a Catholic comp mm. at Clempton Park, actually. So I was every every Saturday morning at six a.m. and it was freezing cold. Were you going to games? Were you following? Yeah, the yeah. Comp? No, we used to come to the games. Um, yeah, we all love all love the Bulldogs. So, uh, yeah, we used to get down here. Um, my uncle, I think, played second grade back in the day. So, yeah, uh, yeah no, I always had a soft spot for the Bulldogs. So. It was a great time to be a fan, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, no, some good um, some good teams get to watch every weekend. So when they put them on TV, anyway. How much did blokes like Cement um, influence your attitude to the game uh, and, and, of course, to the club? Oh, just – just their, like we keep talking about their attitude, like they just turn up mm. and they, you got to beat us. We're, we're not going to let you beat us. Like they, you've got to actually put your, have your best game to beat us. And yeah, yeah we're not going to make it easy. Uh, a lot's been said, mate, about uh, Billy Johnston as a trainer. There's a lot of great stories about him. What, what was he like to play with? He was great, Billy. Um, I actually lived with Billy for six or eight months when, mm. <clears throat> in the early 80s when we first came down. We were boarding at the same. Uh, Wes Mackay, his name was, his house, and um, he used to double me in on his Quacker 900 into uh, Newtown Police Boys Club. Johnny Lewis was trained in boxing. Right, and, that's right, um, yeah. I used to get doubled in with him and um, he'd do his boxing training and I'd go up somewhere else and do some other stuff while he was boxing training. But, um, mate, he, he was just um, – he was a freak, Billy. Mm. You know, he's, um, he's detailed to fitness and um, even back then and he was working at Rothmans. I think Bullfrog got him a job at Rothmans. So he's running the gym there. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, so he, he was um, he was just a tough tough bugger, Billy. In 1985, Phil Gould, I think, played 10 games, um, at least started. Um, a, a different kind of player, obviously. I mean, everyone knew uh, Gus when he was a forward. Uh, what a thinking person's player he was. I mean, you could yeah. just tell talking to him, couldn't you, even at that age? Well, I, I was – Got to play a few reserve grade games back in the day, you know, because we had a pretty strong outfit back in the in them eighty four, mm. eighty five, eighty six. You know, there was um, if you have a look at the reserve grade pack in them days, they could you know probably play first grade in any other um, yeah. you know, team. Incredible um, the reserve death. grade pack we had, but and Gus was part of that and play, he played a lot of first grade Gus. But um, you know, I kind of said before when I come in here, he was coaching then when he was mm. playing, you right. know, and um, you know, he'd always pull you aside and um, have a bit of a chat to you, um, you know, so. Um, a lot of respect there for Gus in that regard. You know, he was – back in them days, he was a bit mm. before his time and, um, you know, he was – probably wasn't as quick on his feet but he was pretty quick between the years, um, you know, with, with his knowledge of it. So, um, you know, he, he, was, um, he was great to play with back then. I'm picking out a few names here because I'm creating a, a picture of a pack and there were many others, as, as you say, that, that um, were rotating this, this incredible depth of talent. But 
I'm picking out different kinds of players. We had such a variety of players. Uh, the, the, the way they approach the game, their different skill sets. Brian Batiste, one of the toughest players to ever play in a Bulldogs pack. Great hitter, Brian. Mm. Great timing, you know, um, uh, intimidating sort of a player. Brian, great bloke too. Um, you know, but you've you got to look at that pack. You know, we had um, – and I was, you know – 20 odd coming up through the ranks, and Langmack was only, you know, yeah. you know, 20 odd in them days. And you had um, Jimmy Lease, yeah, was great playing, player. um, he was playing in reserve grade, you know, and um, uh, Terry Lee Beater, who went on to win yeah. a comp with Parramatta, right. was a yeah. prop. Um, so there's a lot of depth in them, in them, in the in them eras or in that uh, year, in them three years there. So, and it kept on your toes, you know, and there's, you know, I, I got dropped in 85 in the semi final. For the grand final, mm. um, we played St George and we got belted up a bit, and I got dropped for the next game in the, the grand final. So, you know, there, there, you know, there was a lot, lot of blokes snapping at your heels to get you to get your job. Daryl Broman, uh, again, a player who um, I know Langers has uh, done an in-depth interview with Daryl, which we'll be putting on uh, at some stage. But the big man was um, a very talented player, very exciting player to watch. He was great. You know, his ball skills are unbelievable, Daryl, mm. and his knowledge of the game. You know, mm. he ended up coaching here. Later That's on, right, yeah. coach reserve grade right here, Daryl, and um, and still commentating. Yeah, still commentating. But I do. I've got fond memories of Daryl um, training out here at Belmore, and um, you know we have to do time trials, and and um, we'd have to go back and drag him over seventy meters out and not get another one. There'd be five of us, two on, you know, one on each arm, one on each leg, dragging him over. So we didn't have to do um, <laughs> do, do extras. So, um, uh, but you know that that was his his body type, Daryl. You know, and he yeah. um. You know, but his ball skills and um, knowledge of the game are unbelievable. Who was that guy in your training session, Shifty, just while we're on the topic of uh, <laughs> um, getting him through? Because the same stuff would have gone on. Uh, no, you don't have not, to name names. Not, yeah, not too many. <laughs> they were getting a bit more fitter back in yeah, the early 2000s. True. That's uh, about 20 that, years down, down the track. the middle 80s. <laughs> I'll, Correct. Get one, I'll get one up on Mace because he always gets one up on me. <laughs> but when, we, uh, when he turned up from Hunter Mariners in uh, under-19s, we were out the back with uh, Gary Carden and there was a the cricket oval and we had to do the one, two, three, four hundred and then come back down and I think Mace got to the, the first three hundred and he went, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's he, not a poker game, so mate, it's yeah, training. <laughs> it was his first session and he literally, hey Willie, and he did the three runs and then he went, nah, I'm out and just walked back inside. I think, I think he tried to go home that night too. I think that's a difference too because uh, we had a bloke called Dave Cooper was a trainer. Very mm. hard, yeah. And I'm, not, and I'm not saying the other side, the other teams didn't train as hard, but there was that work ethic there. And mm. that, and, and in the, when Billy had used in the yeah. early two thousands, there was that um, that edge, you know, that that hard edge, yeah. Um, you know, that got rubbed off. And as I said, I'm not saying the other sides didn't have it, but there, it was definitely here. Mm. And and um, you trained hard, yeah. played hard, um, <laughs> you know. So that that yeah. was that was um, part and parcel of it. A lot of the great teams in all codes in the 80s, uh, that, that's a pretty common theme. Train hard, play hard. Yeah. Um, you had a draw with Saints uh, in round six, lost to them in round 19 and again in the major semi final in 1985. Dragons are minor premiers. Uh, tell us about that team. Um, it's, I guess it's one of those situations where um, that team that year, because we beat them, doesn't probably get the accolades that some of the others do, but... Uh, what were they like to play against? Obviously not easy. No, they were a hard side. You had Craig Young and um, you know, Graham Wynn and mm. um, Slippy Morris. So they, they had a great side. And they, they um, 85, they were probably the, the dominant side, mm. you know, nearly all year. And you know, I think three, th- they, 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 they made the three from, uh, the grand final in three mm. grades, 23s reserve grade. That's first right. Grade. They were going for all three, yeah. So they, they had a lot of depth in their sides too. But, um, you know, uh, I come on the scene and – in 84, and I played the last couple of games um, in first grade and then uh, played a bit of reserve grade in 85 and come on the come on the scene there in the, in the middle half of the year. And, um, you know, we, we were starting to um, hit a bit of form um, coming into the semis and um, St George towered us up in the first semi. Mm. And I think it was 28-6. And... Um, and they went straight into the grand final. So they were red-hot favourites going into the grand final. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, we come out and beat Parramatta, the, I think, the next week pretty handsomely. Did. and um, 26-0. 26-0. And, um, mm-hmm. 
that put us into the grand final against them. And, you know, it was 7-6. So it, it, that game could have went either way um, what, at the end of the day too. What, what were you thinking after losing – to the Dragons. I mean, you obviously had a mission the next week to beat the Eels, and that's all in that time was obviously a, a huge game uh, back in that era, uh, Bulldogs and Parramatta. But um, what were you thinking in terms of the Dragons, having come out of that Eels game, not having beaten them that year? What do you do? Well, uh, it was a bit daunting kind of thing, but we had, as we get back to when we were talking about defence earlier in the mm. show, you know, we had a, a lot of self belief, and um, Warren had us on track. Mm. Um, and we did score a few tries in that major semi final against Parramatta in that final, get into the grand final, as you said, 26 0. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that gave us a bit of confidence going in there that we could that we could get the points, you know, when we wanted to. We had the players, we had Turvey, you know, um, you know, there were some very good, Andrew Farrar, very good attacking mm-hmm. players in that side. And we had a well drilled defensive unit too. So, you know, um, as I said, the, that, that grand final was 7 6. Now, that could have went either way at the end of the day. It was a tricky game. It was a bit of a tricky game. Kill punch, Graham win. Kel put one on Graham Wynn, yeah, mm. early and um, – Stayed on the field. Stayed on the field, which wouldn't happen these <laughs> days. <laughs> it's, um, it was nearly 40 years ago. Yeah, it was, it was a while ago. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Andrew Farrah kicked a field goal. Andrew Farrah kicked mm. a field goal, um, which – That made it seven was a difference. Yeah. 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 But I think that was um, – and we said it before, that was a game where they changed the rules because we just bombed Glenn Burgess. That's right. Bomb, yeah, bomb, yeah. bomb, bomb, bomb. Yeah. And they had to line kick it out and they changed the rules the next year. That's right. Um, but we played to the rules and uh, Warren made sure of that. But, um, well, yeah, that's how so it is. as I said, um, you know, they were tired, hard, slogging games. And, um, yeah. you know, uh, they could have went either way at the end of the day. Um, but lucky enough that we come out and, and won, them, won, won that, yeah. What, what do you do? And I'll ask you both this. What do you do when, personally, when you've got a team that's just had a good year against you and you need to play them in a final or a grand final? Um, or like we go into this weekend, the Raiders have won seven straight against the Dogs, something like that. Do you, what do you do personally to find something different? Or do you just try and do what you normally do as best you can and uh, assume that'll work if you get it together? Or is there something? Do you look for some kind of edge? Do you have any superstitions? What you know? Do you a, lot do? Of, a lot of players do have superstitions yeah. and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's got to change sometime, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, you know, there, there, there is a lot of rivalry there and there is some, you know, sides that have beat sides seven, you know, seven mm. times in a row and things like that. But at the end of the day, you've got to come out and, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a team, you're, you, you know, you've, you've got to be on the same page. Mm. You know, you can't have, as Punchy Nelson used to say, you can't have one rowing the other way. You ought to, <laughs> you ought to be rowing the same way. And, um, you know, sometimes it's a bit of luck too. Sometimes, you, you know, when they... Yeah, so. Do you remember if Wok had any particular – because the defence was a big deal in that grand final, defending that 7-0 lead for quite a period. So w- did Wok have any particular changes in the way you defended the Dragons for that? Can you remember? Or was um, it just doing what you do better? Just doing what we do better. Yeah. And in that game, I, I come off the bench um, mm. in 85 grand final. Um, I think I took over from Tungsy. Tungsy come off and I think um, Billy Johnson might have come on for um, – Mark Bugner. Mm. There was two ch- two changes. So how's that for a rotation, eh? Yeah, <laughs> not, not bad. bad. Yeah. So um, so me coming on, you know, mm. it's, lo- it's like th- these days when you get them players coming on and giving a was kind of like that. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. giving a bit of a burst again, and yep. um, you know, not that you thought it like that back then. Yeah. You, you know just, what I mean? But it was yeah it got got us on at the right time. Yeah. You know, and um, so yeah, but um, you know, they they, they were um. Great memories and, um, you know, as I said, it could have went either way. What about you, Shifty? Did you have anything, particularly as a bloke who controlled attack, for example, or did, did you have any thing you tried to have up your sleeve for an opponent that you've struggled to get over? Um, no, not really. I'd, if a side had this like 7-0, and 0, well, you got nothing to lose, so I'd just keep trying and, and mm. keep looking at, yeah, what's going on, maybe – I'd, I was kind of a more of a heads-up player. Like, we still had structure, but then I did deviate a little bit and the boys actually responded really well. They'd always push up with me. Mm. As I'm always at his hand out for that kick and and he was the best chaser I've seen. So, mm. yeah. So, I was, yeah, just kind of just running harder and tackling harder than them and you should come away with a win. Um a great year for Steve Mortimer in 85, it must be said, um, because not only did 
we win the grand final, but he captained New South Wales to their first State of Origin series win. That's right. Which was a, a huge achievement at the time. So it was kind of turvy at his peak then, wasn't it? It was great to play with back then, Turv. And, um, you know, I never got to play him in the early 70s and 80 when he won the grand final. He was just on fire then. Mm. But he had a lot of respect and, um, you know, it. He, back then it was, you know, there was not too many g- – Generals and a few more soldiers, you know, like he was running the show kind of thing. You know yeah. what I mean? And you just do your job, do what you got to do. Mm. Don't deviate. You know what I mean? I'll look yeah. after other stuff. And, um, you know, so that's how we went down kind of thing. So so it was a good um, blend. You know, we all knew um, Did what, he talk, what our job was. He looked, It looked like from the fans' point of view, you, you see what you can only see on TV or at the ground, of course. It's, it's sometimes not easy, particularly if you're at a ground like the SCG, for example. But – how much talking did he do? How much did you hear him during the game? Oh, he'd do a bit of yapping. Yeah. Yeah. To have you, he'd do a bit of yapping. Not as much as Langmack. <laughs> but that was a different kind uh, of yapping, wasn't it? A different kind of yapping, yeah. <laughs> different kind of yapping. But as I said, you've got to have your soldiers. Yeah, you yeah. The blokes out there yeah. just doing the doing the hard work and doing the grind. And, and when something's br- brilliant's on, you know, you had Turvey there mm. and um, Terry. Yeah. And um, Terry Bar. So as long as you got out there and done your job um, – I wasn't much of a talker. Just got in, got in there, yeah. and you know, got it done, and let all the other blokes well, you, do the talking. You, but, um, you use body language, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Billy Army kick out let, type of body language. Let your actions do the talking. Yeah, and sometimes uh, you, you need, can't all be talking though. Obviously, you can't be all talking. No. And, and, and as I said, yeah. you got, you know, you got to be just focused on what you got to do, mm. and um, you know, let the let the other blokes that can do that. You know, just run off them. How much talking did Langers do to the team, and how much did he do to the other team? Probably more to the others. Um, <laughs> Who was the biggest niggler in the in the team? Who did the niggle better than anyone else? Oh, well, he wasn't much of a niggler, but he was all just just nonstop. Yeah, you know, smash him, some man, smash yeah, him, like right. you know, yeah, that sort of thing. And, and, you know, it, it was just <laughs> just didn't let up. You know what I mean? And he wasn't. Um, he hasn't changed. Either. I played some good sledges over the years. You know, yeah. check, uh, Ricky Stewart was great. You know, when, yeah. when the Oranges I played with him, he was he could let a few go. But um, <laughs> Terry Hill. Yeah, oh, Terry. Well, yeah, Terry yeah. was vicious on the sledge, <laughs> um, but Langers wasn't. You know, he was just um, he could two plays before. It, you know, he right. was calling out, "Get over there! He's gonna, you know, he's gonna get it there, and he's gonna get it over there, right. and you be there." And you know, what I mean, yep. he was like that. So yeah. he was talking a lot like that. Right. Not so much giving it to the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how much talking did you do? Um, and who else talked? I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I don't know how much you I weren't talked. listening. I, I, no, I don't really like, like. I probably did a lot of talking, mm. but I wasn't much of a sledger, so I mm. just, I just watch, watch what's going on, and I spoke when I like needed to, or I'd just say, "Oh God, like get a yeah. quick play of the ball, like I'm kicking, I'm kicking next, get in a dummy half and, and get yeah. it away, and then everyone's already pushing up anyway." So, but yeah, no. And Willie did the niggle. Was he the was he the main yeah, yeah, protagonist? He, he doesn't stop talking. Yeah. He still doesn't <laughs> stop talking. So no, he was pretty good. He's um, yeah, he got under a few skins. So yeah. more making him laugh more than anything. He he just uh, that's he's, he's good. He's good to have a beer with actually, Mace. I, I could imagine he'd be pretty funny. Yeah. I mean, if you can get him laughing, if you can get your opponents laughing on a rugby league game, that's that's actually an achievement, isn't it? Yeah. Well, he, he didn't stop. He'd he'd keep going until he got you. <laughs> So, but he backed it up, so yeah. I've got to give him that. He he ran hard, he tackled hard, he didn't stop the whole game mm. until until folks he gave him a rest, and then he come back on and do the same thing. He just I had a great back of forwards in the early two thousands, two thousand two, hundred percent. Some young kids coming through, mm. and um, yeah, they just yeah they were just strong. Uh, let's get on to that now. Seventeen game winning streak in. Uh, in 2002, which even the great teams of the 80s weren't able to achieve. Um, but what do you remember most from that amazing part of the season? Um, winning. I don't, <laughs> no, I don't know. I'd, Was it hard just, to, when you got to, you know, 13, 14, like you're getting into really rare territory there. How, what was, what was Folksy and Billy and those guys saying to you each week? Because, was there any danger of... Getting into cru- cruise control? Um, no, not really. I, to be honest, I didn't even know we were up to that that high. Like I just, when I played, I, I worried about the game coming up, mm. not 
like not the game, two yeah. games down the track. Like I just okay, we got this. We mm. we're playing Joey. We're playing Joey this week. Shit, we're gonna be have to be on our game. Mm. And so I'd worry about that for that week. Has him kicks it from the sideline to get us get us home and that. That was arguably was, the most memorable game that the mm, Newcastle yeah. sideline kick. I, I think that yeah. was number sixteen. I think it was getting towards the yeah. yeah. It was getting towards the end, but yeah, that was like the papers all wrote about it and that, and we I didn't really look at the papers, so <laughs> I kind of stayed clear of that. But um, it was just a good feeling. We we had a real tight tight knit group, like the downstairs where the change rooms were. There was the lockers, and there was enough room for a like handball. <laughs> and dead set, that was the toughest handball games <laughs> ever. So we do our morning session instead of like we'd send three or four up for lunches, and then the rest of us would play handball. Mm. And we'd play there for three hours, and you'd probably you'd be sweating going to the video. <laughs> but that's what we're like. We yeah. we did everything together. We we went f- like for a beer together. We just yeah, we just really close, and and that's it's like come it's, straight on the field. That's right. Like Shifty says, like winning them games, that you're not thinking about winning the next one, but there's mm. a it's not an arrogance, but it's confidence, mm. and it's with everyone, you yeah. know, and, and it's it's a, it's a chemistry, and you, and it's you don't have to talk about it, you just know it's there, mm. you know, and it was in, the, in their mateys when yep. we, were, we were making grand finals, and the same as the other sides, mm. you know, and the, you know the good uh, Brisbane sides and the good Canberra sides, yep. it's not an arrogance, but it's a confidence, mm. and they know if they're on, they can win, and and like Shifty when you're in that era with you, you know, yeah. if you're, you know, not too many sides are going to beat you. And, mm. um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a confidence within the group and, um, you know, it's, and it's, it's great when it's like that. Did you guys anything, have anything like handball, you know, ping pong or something that you might have played? No. No, just footy and drinking? Yeah, footy and drinking, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> After the pub on a well, Thursday had, night, on a Tuesday night. They were working. On a Wednesday night. Well, that's working. true, yeah, that's they true. They were working. Yeah. So Good point, yeah. yeah. Good point. Um, it ended in New Zealand against the Warriors, twenty two fourteen. I guess in the context of the season, how how did you take that at the time? Because something else was brewing that we none of us knew about at the time. But uh, was it a big deal? No, because they were a very good side that year. I'll get onto that in yeah, more detail. No. Yeah. Oh, Stacey Jones, like yeah. one hell of a player. So um, yeah, they. Well, they were. Tr- everyone was trying to beat us, mm. so everyone would really turn up. And that day, um, I remember it was al- it's always cold and wet over there, but they were too good for us. Yeah. And like we put our hands up, we got on with it. Like the next week, mm. and I think we came out against. I think it was Parramatta, and then I think after that, yeah, everything hell hell broke loose. It sure did. W- do you remember when you first heard about the salary cap breach? I think it was either just straight after the game or the next day. Um, yeah, that that was about it. I, Were you I on your own? Were you in a group? What was? Um, I think I was just at home. Um, not too sure. I was coming in to speak to um, about a, about signing a new contract uh, on the Monday. So mm. uh, didn't that didn't eventuate? So <laughs> that but, got uh, shelved. Yeah, that got shelved. Yeah. I, I think they had a bit. Um, Bigger fish to fry, uh, so yeah, I got I got pushed to the back and got sorted out next year, the, the following year. Um, there was a period between the announcement of the breach and and of course the announcement of the punishment. What was that period like? Ultimately, it was half a million dollar fine and thirty seven competition points taken away. So all those seventeen games uh, basically counted for nothing in the end. But during that period of waiting, Shifty, I mean, crikey, there must have been some conversations in the dressing room and elsewhere. What was training like? It was a, it was a very long week. That's all I can remember. Um, I know folks, he did his best because I was one of the reporters covering it at the time. Um, and folks, he did his best, of course, to take the pressure off the players, get on with yeah. the game. And, of course, the administration is is the focal point. So how hard was it? Was it? It, it was hard. Um like we didn't know what, like mm. the next bloke was on. Yeah. So it's like you sign you, you want to get what you what you're worth. So you sign for whatever whatever they gave you, mm. and then but as a total, we didn't know what each other were on. So it's a bit hard. It's just a long week. I, I was actually starting to think about it now. Like seventeen games, it was it was crushing for me. I 
I probably that was one of my better years. Um, mm. And to lose seventeen after after winning seventeen, yeah, to lose all thirty seven points, I think we would have ended up with fifty one points for the year that mm. year. It was Incredible. Just, it was just crushing after the effort we put in and all the training, and it was just yeah, it was it was quite uh, quite heartbreaking actually. When the news broke, as a former player, of course, and still a valued member of the Bulldogs family, what was your reaction? I suppose you would have had some conversations yeah. with a lot of the other old blokes. Yeah, it was a bit of shock, obviously, you know, and um, as Brett said, you know, you, you, there's a lot on the line. You, you've trained your ass off all year mm. and um, 17 in a row and, and looking good in a grand final. Yeah. You know, or getting to a grand final. You know, it's a lot of hard work and to have that just taken straight off, you know, um, yeah, so obviously you, know, you felt you felt for him, but um, you know, it was yeah, what what he did was one of their things. But it, it is hard, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's your your, your ex club, and you know, and you, you know what they go through and what how hard they train and and the and the stuff they put on the line to get that far. So you know, and uh, the coincidental thing, and one of the reasons we bring this up this week is that um, the announcement was the day before the Raiders game in Canberra, and. Uh, they lost 38-34, a strange game. I remember watching the game, obviously, and uh, everyone was bewildered, particularly everyone was just shattered. But uh, goodness me, what was it like, Shifty? Tell us an I- Give us an idea of since the announcement was made, what it was like in those 24 hours and, and playing that game. Well, our minds weren't focused for the first half. I think it was something like, I think it was 28, 28-6 at half time or something like that. Like it was, Our minds were just elsewhere mm. um we didn't think we'd lose the points we were hoping so we kept telling ourselves kept telling ourselves and then when you finally get that the last like you're losing 37 points it's mm. yeah pretty pretty crushing so to go out there and then try and play like not many not many got uh too much sleep the night before so to go out there and try and put a, a game together was quite tough but um the second half we come out and and kind of got into our what we've done in the 17 straight, so mm. and we nearly got away with it. Um, yeah, I think we just yeah just fell short with a, a couple of minutes to go. So, and from that point, you actually finished the season with a couple of wins. Mm. And I remember Folksy telling me, particularly that last round, uh, Brisbane. Yeah, how 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 that felt. It was yeah. like well, it was like a grand final, but not much consolation. But what was that like? That was um, – I remember that game. We um, The crowd came on the field and carried us all off and um, it was – yeah, it was quite intense that. But we, we treated it like a grand final. And Brisbane, they were – Alfie Langer, Darren Lockyer, like Petro, there's Webke, like the names yeah. you could rattle off. And we had to be on. Um, and I think we, we got out to a good lead early, I think, and, yeah, just kept going with it and – I think I even got a field goal that day. Lost only a few games all season, um, even though you lost a lot of points. Uh, the Roosters, who finished fourth, beat the Warriors in the grand final. The Warriors actually finished minor premiers. Um, and I'm hoping the Warriors have another good year this year. It's, uh, it's due. And they've certainly committed a lot to rugby league in the last few years with COVID and everything, so good luck to them. But um, it was a wide-open, interesting final series. But, boy, it must have been really weird for you guys. What did you do? Did you, did you just switch off and... Take a break. Did you? Could you watch footy I didn't, after that? I didn't watch. Didn't watch a game. Wouldn't think so. No, nah. it'd be hard to. Mm. Hard to watch it. Yeah, I should. Know. I should. We yeah. should have been playing there. That's that's what. Mm. So yeah. Now I love me golf. So I was, I was uh, playing golf at Bankstown every Saturday, and I didn't didn't He's go good inside. Too. He's good golfer. I didn't, Better I didn't, than Bar. Uh, oh, nah, I don't know. Nah. I don't know. Good scorer, but it's a good golfer. No, no, Bar can play. Bar's good. Yeah, so, he's played a lot of golf. Yeah. yeah. We we drove a cart into a tree once playing oh. in a charity game uh, somewhere. I won't say where. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that was another – that was one of the great bar <laughs> golf stories. Yeah. Anyway, um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. And how would you feel at the end? How do you get up for – thankfully, two years later, um, you got there. And I know a lot of the players in that team were from the 2002 side, so – um, but you didn't know that at the time. No. <laughs> so where, yeah. where do you go from there? Uh, well, with the salary cap, we had a, a few um, – everyone, I think, took a bit of a pay cut to stay mm. together because we we kind of just – we should have won 02, mm. 03. 
Roosters got us at the back end. We had a few injuries, not making that as an excuse. They were too good for us on the day. Mm. Um, but 04, it just between the older guys and the new guys coming through. There like was a couple had, of really young faces yeah, coming through there, so Sonny Bill and JT. Yeah. Sonny Bill, Willie Tonga, yeah. Matty Utai, Rennie Matua. Uh, I can just keep going with them, like Benny Harris, I think. Yep. Like everyone, everyone just, just came together. We had that. Mm. I think handball started again downstairs. <laughs> Not that uh, Freddie liked it, but but uh, Freddie Seraldo. Yeah, Freddie, yeah, he always wins. Still, still, yeah, yeah. Uh, still looking after the team, yeah. Freddie. But no, he but, won't come on the show, by the way. I tried to get him in, <laughs> but we're working on it. Uh, I suppose he can't tell ninety nine percent of his favourite stories. But anyway, um, and look, we've we've visited two thousand and four with you before, and and um, I suppose but what we didn't do was in the context of O two. Was there a lot of thought? I suppose because in O four you had a new crisis to deal with in in Coffs Harbour. So I suppose was there much thought about O two uh, in from from you the core group that was there, or, or was it just by then time you'd got through it? Just yeah, just just got through it. Yeah, uh, we we were just a really tight. Tight knit group, and I yeah, I felt like we could just beat anyone, mm. and that's what it felt like when we used to go on on the field. And well, that's it was a good game that one against the Roosters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a yeah. good game. I like we were walking off, and someone was like, "You look worried," and I was just like, "I wasn't worried. I don't, yeah, I don't know what I don't know what it was about. I just said oh, we're going to win this. This is at halftime. At halftime, yeah. walking off, and it was um, what was it 13, 13 six, mm. and. Everyone said I was looking down, and I was just I was just thinking about what I was going to do the next half, and I wasn't worried at all. I don't mm. don't ask me why. I I got I can't explain it, but I just was all week. I was confident we were going to win. I was I was sitting up in the grandstand with Ricky. I was doing a bit of defensive work with Ricky mm-hmm. that year at the Roosters. Yeah, and I was sitting up in the box with him in the coach's box <laughs> <laughs> that year. So mm. I know it was a good game. It was a very good game, and I know some of the blokes from the Roosters side as well that played in that grand final. Yeah. Good, good guys, and um, they that really hurt for them too. Yeah, it it was one of those games uh, that they felt like they could have won, and rightly so, I suppose. But that's a lot of grand finals are like that. Mm. Um, not all of them, but some of them are like that. Um, Cement, you you left the Bulldogs for Hunslet, uh, but it wasn't really leaving. The NRL was it um, on your official record? You've gone and played in England, but it was a bit different in those days. It was a bit different. We could go over for a short season, they call it. So you'd leave, you know, after the last game, whatever your last game was. If you didn't make the semis after the last comp game, if, if you got beaten in the semis, you'd leave the next week, and or after if you made the grand final the week after. But mm. um, but you had to be back for the first comp game, so you'd miss pre-season training, obviously, and yep. um, which wasn't a worry because you're you know match fit anyway, coming back playing. But um. You know, a lot of the boys from Canterbury were, went over before me and they were playing for um, Halifax. How did you get to play for Hunslet? David Ward, who was an ex-Pommy um, uh, hooker, yeah. was coaching him. He played at Leeds, uh, uh, right. Wardy, and he, he come over and coached Hunslet. And um, they'd won uh, the next league under Second and, and division, got promoted yeah. into first division. Mm. And um, that was the year that I went over. And um, he had a couple of Aussies went over, Mark Hone. Next Brisbane Bronco um, mm. went over and um, a couple of Redcliffe boys, Trevor Benson um, and a bloke called Terry Webb. Um, and then had a couple of young kids coming through. Um, but, you know, we ain't, we only oh, – I think I was over there for 16 or 17 games and we only went about three. <laughs> but um, oh, great memories. And yeah. Our home ground was Ellen Road where oh, Leeds right, United play. Oh, yeah. So Hunslet's around that area. Right. And a very, very famous club in England, Hunslet. It's one of the first clubs over there with, I think, Workington or something, you know, or Warr- Warrington, Warrington. That, that yeah. when they started over there yeah. in 100 years ago. So it's a, it's a famous club over there, Hunslet. But um, they've had, you know, they were, I think they were very good in the, you know, in the 50s and the 60s and 70s. And, yeah. and, and um, but yeah, yeah, Ellen Road was our home ground. And um, yeah, I, I had some great times. Did it, you'd achieved so much already by then. And, and as you say, you're playing with a promoted club. Did it? Did it develop your game at all or was yeah. it just an interesting phase for other reasons? No, it did. Right. And, um, it, you know, it did my attacking game, so to speak. You know, I was, was going to say, the English game is a bit different well, to Well, you run, you run yeah. more, um, yeah. you know. And um, so, yeah, that was great f- for me, that, you know. And, um, uh, 
you know, and you got to realise the year I was over there, um, you know, Tunksy was playing for Leeds, mm. Peter mm. Jackson was playing for Leeds, Slippery Morris was playing for Leeds, right? Marty Gurr, um, you know, Kevin um, Les Boyd was over there back in the end of his career right. playing for Warrington, Kevin Tamati, um, great player. Yeah, you know, there was tough. a lot of lot of Auss- mm. Aussies over there playing. You know, going over for them short seasons, and um, so um, you know, it was just you know Christmas time, everyone would get together. All the Aussies and yeah. and um, and uh, have a bit of a party. So and and shiver. But but it was uh, the old days. I remember <laughs> our prop, one of our props, um, Andy Sykes, his name was, and he was a, you know, he was about six foot four and about one hundred and fifteen kilos. Andy and bounced at all the nightclubs, you know, in the right. area. We were, we were Yorkshire, yeah. you know, deep, broad accent and tough lad. Tough. <laughs> he got bought up tough and. You know, when um, we were playing in a Challenge Cup game and Wardy said, um, where's Andy? We're missing Andy. Andy was out in the car park selling leather jackets <laughs> out of his boot, boot of his car. It was 15 minutes before the game. <laughs> <laughs> had to go in and get him and bring him back out. <laughs> so, um, you know, there was yeah. a lot of good stories like that, you know. A lot um, of characters. Yeah. Did you get used to the cold? Uh, not really. No. No one ever does. No. <laughs> what about you, Shifty? You went over in 07. Um, but you, you played for some very successful yeah. sides, Castleford and then Catlin Dragons. Well, yeah. That was a much longer stint, obviously, in a very different phase of, yeah. of, of the game. Um, yeah. That was not a summer holiday, was it? No. Nah. Uh, not was... that I'm suggesting that was a holiday for you, mate, but it was in yeah. betwe- wasn't in between seasons. No, no, no. Actually, I, yeah, I still have one more year with the dogs, mm. um, but uh, the job at Castleford was there in 2008. And it wasn't going to be there the following year. Right. And um, I was nine short of 200. I wish I'd played 200 with the dogs. But, yeah, just had to – needed a change. I'd been through a yeah, divorce and stuff mm-hmm. like that and I needed a change and like going uh, to uh, the UK for a bit of a bit of a change. So. Pe- people do forget that. The fans um, do forget uh, when they talk about player movements and – a lot of it comes out in the media now because I suppose there's a lot of scrutiny now. There's all these different media yeah. outlets and social media, so people feel like they know a lot more about your private lives. But a lot of people do forget that even back in the old days, you were holding down a job and you had a personal life as well. So if you, if you had some problems in your personal life or things weren't going great, that often influenced your decisions. And the fans don't quite know how to deal with that because they yeah. think you guys are all just superheroes running around in your uniforms all the time. Well, I remember my... Um my experience with with Hunter's letters, I, I, I think I signed down for fifteen thousand quid or something back then, mm. which I don't know was thirty grand or whatever. Yep. But um, I, I spent half of it. <laughs> you know, they give me half when I got there, but because it was three hundred quid for the win and you know fifty quid for the loss, we only yeah. won three games. <laughs> you're getting fifty quid a week, <laughs> so I had to dip in and get half of it. Yeah. And on the way home. Yeah. They give me the other half and the bounce, the check bounce when I got home. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, did you get it back eventually? Listen, I, I had a great time over there. No, <laughs> I, I end up getting a bit of it back, but um, uh, you know, back then all their chairmen and I, I suppose I don't know if it's any different these days. I'm not too. We're all multi millionaires, you know. They yeah, owned the yeah, clubs, yeah. That backed them. They were all at big companies, and he must have went bust the bloke that owned them. I don't know, but it's um, happened. It's happened, but um, yeah. you know, just the experience for me to go out there and play. You know, um, was unbelievable, and um, I, I loved it. Yeah, I had a great time. And for a halfback over there, mate, as we said, the English game very traditionally, anyway, it's mm. probably evolved a bit more closer to ours, I think. But it traditionally, was always very creative. Um, uh, maybe it's fair to say cement, not as intense, but but oh, it probably is these days over there. But yeah, yeah it was they're very passionate. They love yeah. it over there in um, you know in Yorkshire, where it's in, in round Leeds and in that area, and um, you know they 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 love the game, you mm-hmm. know, and they they love the Aussies coming over, you mm-hmm. know, to, mm-hmm. to play. And um, but um, you know it was intense. It, there was some 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 tough games there. Don't worry about that. It was pretty hard. But and as uh, a halfback, you would have enjoyed it, wouldn't you? Yeah, no, I'd, I had a great time. I was very similar to, um, well, actually the same situation. So Castleford won the first division, and they got promoted to Super League, mm. and that's why I, like I said before, I had to go that year early. Um, so yeah, I had a very tough first year. Um, I was a young well, side, said. like the average, average, average age was 20. Yeah. I think there was a, like, there was four or five that were 18, never played Super League before. So it was, a yeah, it was a bit 
bit tough that year, but we got through it. We won a few games, and then actually the following year, um, we actually got on a roll, and we were mm-hmm. going quite well. And then and then I broke me uh, fifth metatarsal, so I had to get a screw inserted and. First came back, broke it again, snapped the screw, so I had to go back and get it again, and and then that was yeah, I was started hating the world then. It was, <laughs> but it was uh, it was a great time over there. I was yeah, West Yorkshire, where Castleville was. Um, used to go to go into Leeds and that for a day out, and mm. um, yeah, it was a beautiful country, and the people over there yeah, they more love it. welcoming, yeah. like they just took you in and they. I still get uh, happy birthdays from a few fans. Really? Yeah. So um, one of the uh, one of the wingers' mums always writes to me and says hello, and yeah. So it's quite nice to be still thought of. Um, you know, without getting into the details, obviously, but w- when you've had a big change, as you said, in your personal life, and you've gone over to England, does it actually help to have something you've got to focus on? Like you said, it was a tough year, but you had a big responsibility. Obviously, was it was it helpful or was it harder? To, to, to be so far away from home and, you know, dealing with everything? Um, no, I, I, I just enjoyed myself. Yeah. Like the boys, I felt a bit younger because the kids were – like the, the guys I was playing with were a lot younger than me. Yeah. So they were all – they liked going out and stuff like that. So Shifty went out. For <laughs> 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 um, but we became a tight group and then – the following year, we got a couple extra players, Mitchell Sargent, Rangy Chase, mm-hmm. and they and they just gave us another like another yeah. step up, and and it, everyone had been there for a year, got a, got more experience, started and we started putting a few good wins together. Why did you keep playing in the Wollongong area when you came back? Um, well, when I went to car, when I went to France, uh, Kevin Walters was a coach, and he said, "Oh, okay, yeah, it, it, for Catlin at the yeah, time, for yeah, for Catlins." And he said, "Oh, come over, and I'm still in the Challenge Cup. Um, sign a year, and I'll, I've got one more year, and I'll, I'll get you an, another deal." And so I was just like, "That's perfect. Like that'll mm-hmm. do me. That'll see me out." Um, but then Kev got a phone call from um, I don't. Um, I don't even think of his name. The Melbourne coach? I don't know. Oh, Do Bellamy. Know yeah, Bellamy. He had to come back and assist. Yeah. Yep. Come back and uh, help me. And I and Kev came to me and said, oh, shift out. I don't know what to do, mate. I told you I was going to be here for one more year. And I was just like, oh, where, where are you going? And he right. said, oh, Bellamy asked if I can come. And I was just like, mate, go. I yeah. said, go and learn from the best. It turned out pretty well for him. Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. you look at what's going on this year. Well, I, I thought it was really nice that he said, yeah. what do you want me to – like, not what do you want me to do. I but, Yeah. I was like, I said, I'll take care of myself. And they actually offered me a contract for one more year. And then Trent Robinson, the Roosters took over his own halfback. Um, uh. And so they shut the door on, on me. So I came back and still had that bit of a hunger. And um, Helensburg offered me a, a game mm-hmm. and a job in the mines. Mm-hmm. So I ended up doing that and worked in the mines for four or five years. Until my body told me to get out. <laughs> <laughs> and Camden, did a bit of coaching at Camden. Yeah. Uh, my cousins, I played one game. Yeah. Played, yeah my, all my cousins, uh, there was four boys and they all played there. My, oh, I call them my nephews, but my cousins' boys mm. play there now. And Mitchell, Mitch Newton was coaching it. Ah, uh, right. And yeah. he was president there for a couple of years. And he asked me to come out and do some stuff. So, yeah, I came, went out there and did that and really enjoyed it. And, so, yeah, coaching me sons now. Uh, you mentioned um, cement. You're in the box as Ricky uh, for that game. What, what Did you want to keep assistant coaching or defence coaching? Well, or? I wasn't an assistant coach at all. I was just doing a bit of part-time stuff there. And back then it was a bit different in defence. Consultancy. Kind of. Oh, a couple what of days a great a week. gig that is, consultancy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got to realise back in the early 2000s when he was coaching there, yeah. you had Ivan Cleary. Yeah, coaching right. Coaching then at 23 yeah. or everything. And then um, Shane Flanagan. A good school. Coaching reserve grade. Yeah. Cardi, Johnny Carwright was there coaching. Oh, right. And he's um, – yeah. In that yep. – Dean Pay. Yeah. Yep. Dean Pay started there. Um, That's so right. So he had a fairly good, um, you know, up-and-coming yeah. coaching brigade there. Yeah. And, um, so – but I was just coming in, you know, day a week or he'd just say, listen, mate, take such – take them out the back and right. do a bit of um, technique. Um, yep. It's a bit different. They don't do it these days. Did you um, work with Michael Crocker? Yeah. 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 
Lovely bloke. No, oh, he's a great Good bloke. bloke. I, I, yeah. He's one of the blokes I referred to earlier uh, because I spent a fair bit of time with him. He was on one of the regular guests on my TV show on Fox for a while and just a great bloke to deal with. And yet my kids, when, when I first had him on the show, my kids said to me, oh, because they, they, they were huge yeah. fans, my young blokes watching the 2004 Grand Final, so they didn't have a big opinion of any of those players. And I, they said, what are you doing with Michael Crocker on your show? I said, he's actually a good bloke, son, just because yeah. he plays for the Roosters. Yeah. <laughs> it's, but it's, our kids great when they're fans well, of footy. You're getting back when we started the show about defence and spotting yeah. halfbacks. Yeah. And one of my main jobs was with the, getting the halfbacks. I think um, Finchie was halfback then and Sal, Jamie Salward and yep, come, yep. coming through and I'd – Grab them and take them out the back, and they'd get three or four front rowers just jamming in on them, <laughs> running at them straight, and they had to tackle them. Yeah, you know, and um, you know that was the way it was. It hadn't evolved to what it is now back then in the early two thousands. So it was a lot of technique stuff. Um, and is it done with them? Well, on that, just quickly on that point, we might have to make it our last point because we've been going for a while. But um, is it harder now also for for the the smaller players? Because there's so much emphasis on wrapping up the ball first, instead of the old days where you'd go around the legs first, and you know, a couple Pearl. might come in later and wrap the ball up. But is I, that a big thing? Now? I've got to be honest with you, mate. I don't think there's too many small players. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, you know, well, the halfbacks are six one. Yeah, you know, yeah. They're, they're yeah. bigger than what they look on TV. Yeah, good point. Yeah, you know what I mean. Is and that a shame, though, in a sense, cement that that, that there isn't that, that we want room for smaller players, though, because yeah. we don't want kids who are small to say I can't play rugby league. Oh, that's right. That'd be a shame. But I don't but, know. But there is some small players. But you know, the, the majority of them are you know all your yeah your front rowers and your second rowers, and you know we're all six three six yep. four. And the wingers, but are even huge. the even the, the halfbacks are six foot now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, the, the wingers are massive. Wingers, the yeah. wingers are six. What's well, Daniel yeah. Tupu? The wingers yeah. are front rowers. Yeah, they're playing a front rowers game. Mm -hmm. You know, they're taking it one in off the things. They're, yep. they're, they're yep. an extra front row. Yep. These mm -hmm. days, the way it's played. But. That's a good point. Uh, it's just that I thought you know, the, uh, even a couple of times now, and I'm, it's easy for me to say. But I'm not because I'm not out there. But you see someone, you know, inside the twenty, running at the line, and you think, I'm sure they could make a legs tackle and still get away with it. There's still enough room. There's a, but, yeah. there's a few but they, out there. Yeah, Cameron Murray, he's he's the best. He chops them down. And Jake Trebojevic is pretty good. Oh, Jake, yeah, he, Jake's yeah. the same. They he's, they just hit it yep. so hard and yeah. and flip them over. Yep. But there is a lot of emphasis on wrapping the ball up, mm. and, and, I, and I think sometimes it backfires. They actually. It does. They actually wrap the ball up, then they get carried over the line. You, you know what I hate most about defence these days, right. and it really gets to me, is when you know you got two or three in a tackle and someone comes in from behind, yeah, and jams yeah, up in behind. Yeah. You know when you can't see him, yeah, you yeah. can't see him coming. Mm. He, he's holding you up there. He's got you there. He's got you there, and then they just zero in at the back here. Yeah, and it makes me. Yeah, you know, I, I just that's when you it. can get some serious. You can damage done. And, and, and yeah. I, I, you know. Well, they've tried to regulate uh, right, that of out course. of the game. Yeah, and is is there more importance for the refs to call held earlier yeah. because of yeah. that um, yeah. to try and avoid that? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not blaming the refs it by the way. In just, and it creeps out, you know, yeah, and then yeah. tackles and um, but it just really irritates me when I see it. Yep, that um, would help. That would help. Can I know. Call, I'm not. Yeah, yeah calling held a little bit earlier and said because there's three. Really strong guys, and mm. they're all going different directions. Yeah, just, so something's got to give. Mm, mm, and then yeah. there's someone else coming in, chopping, chopping them the other way. Mm. From beyond, you can't see them. Yeah, yeah. You can't yeah. brace. You can't, you can't like do anything. Do anything. So it's yeah. That is arguably the most dangerous aspect of the game, isn't it? it? Because is. a lot of other stuff you can actually. Well, if you can see something coming, yeah. you can brace yourself. It's a bit for, yeah, mm. but you when you have got three it. blokes hanging off here and someone's zeroing mm. in from behind in the back here, mm. you know. Anyway, you can't prepare for that. No. One more question before we go: Was there a player or person um, that you learned most from in your career? Your most inspirational? I, I had a few. Mm. I, I love Jeff Robinson. You know, I, I learned from him on the field. Um, well, fingers crossed, Robbo's on next week. Yeah. yeah. With, with, but he's with Langers, so yeah. he doesn't have to say much. <laughs> If his well, voice, because you know, his voice is a bit scratchy, oh, so Langers will just fill in the gaps. Yeah, Sorry, go on. But Jeff was yeah. good off the field. Yeah, he loved to drink back then, and he he um, and if you're getting a bit out of yourself, you know what I mean, <laughs> right? He would kick you up. So the he ass. was good that way. Yeah, Great. good. Yeah, you know I mean, not not yeah. in a bad way. Yeah, yeah, just but pull your side and make hay. Mm. You know, you settle. You know, you know, up at the pub and having a couple on a Friday <laughs> night. You know, yeah, you're getting a bit out of yourself, mate. You just pull your head in a bit. <laughs> 
You That's know. so important. Yeah, it was. And Especially these, these days. days. Mm. Can't do it, mate. And, you know, Andrew Farrow was great mm. Mm. For, for us. You know, he's, I think his nickname was Pop because that's what he was like. He was like a father yeah. figure, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the, the Mortimer boys, you know, yeah. the three of them, Peter, Steve, Chris, you know, there, there was some good role models there mm. for when I was young coming through, you know, and um, no big edits, you know, mm. just do the job. And um, folksy, yeah, great. I, I live three doors from folksy, three <laughs> three doors down the road. You know, yeah. back in them days, lived in the same street, and um, you know they they were just good blokes, and and um, you know they, they were you, know, you still think about it today, you know. Shifty, um, yeah, Ricky, Ricky mm. Stewart, yeah, um, yeah. When when I first started, when I got up in the in the first grade, he. Just taught me a couple of things, um, uh, four, well, actually four things to look in a game, and mm. um, so I just worked on that. And yeah, he just he just kept feeding me information. I'd, uh, I'd be here for a week if I if I went through it, but yeah, no, he was amazing. His kicking game, where I, where he was looking for, what he was looking for, what the defense is doing, stuff like that. It was mm. just it was just a great insight to have mm. at that at that point in time of my career. So. Mm. Yeah, got a lot of. Um, and I got I got to play with Ricky um, in the Origin. I have become good mates with him. That's right. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. And, um, he's a great bloke. He's a bit misunderstood, stick, and uh, but one of the most loyal blokes you'd ever meet. Mm. You know, he's a really good bloke, Ricky. So and has achieved when you think about it, has achieved so much in the game. Yeah. Um, remarkable career as a yeah. player and a coach. He's uh, passionate. And it's, he's passionate. Yeah. Yes. He's improved the game of rugby league. You know, um, in in so many ways. Shifty, thank you so much. Um, Brent Sherwin, David Gillespie, thank you. Um, This is Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. We'll do it all again next week.